So welcome back to our study of Paul's letter to the Philippians. We had a break last week for those of you who were here last week. Uh, and let me first uh, thank God for Pastor Ken Hollington uh, who shared God's word last week. Uh, I hope uh, that looking into God's original uh, intent and design for his temple uh, has shown us just how valuable uh, those of us are who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, that he has chosen us to be his temple, uh, that he has chosen us to be his dwelling place, the place where his spirit resides and his presence is, is uh, and we can meet his presence. Uh, where before in the Old Testament, uh, they had to carry, like, you know, in, the, in, in Exodus, they had to carry this thing this temple uh, everywhere they go and they had to like build it up and uh and and then um you know when once they got to the to the promised land they they build up temp the temple um for god's presence to reside in but all of that is just a pointer to where god is actually bringing us to where he can reside uh in in us and with us uh through the holy spirit so uh, hopefully we uh we saw that and hopefully we saw the value of of that when it comes to our our physical bodies how this our bodies are now the temple of of the holy spirit and again i want to thank god for uh brother ken who, who shared that with us last week uh so this morning we're gonna jump back into our study of uh paul's letter to the philippians and it's it's funny how uh today's uh topic uh as you can see from the title uh, the title of our message by the way is i've got joy down in my heart uh, those of you who know Sunday school people, you know, Sunday school kids, they, they know that song. Uh, most of us know that song. Our, our topic today is about joy. And the reason why I say it's funny that it, this is the topic for today because of the weather. Uh, <laughs> the weather right now is really not conducive to, <laughs> uh, to joy and, and happiness. And, uh, you know, it's, it's usually when it's raining, it's... Uh, people feel down and people feel uh, depressed uh, a lot of times. Yeah, that's what it, that happens when it's when it's raining. But I praise God for it because uh, as we learn about joy this morning, I hope we can apply it right away. <laughs> you know that we can have joy despite the the weather, and uh, we can have joy in any in any circumstance. That's what we're gonna take up this morning. And I think that if you read. Um, Paul's letter to Philippians, this is one of the main themes in this letter. He keeps on appearing over and over again. In uh, Philippians uh, 1 verse 3, uh, it says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, um, always in every prayer of mine for you all, for you all making my prayer with joy. Uh, so verses 3 and 4, uh, all the way up to 5, right? because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So even in the first part of the letter, uh, Paul's already talking about joy. Uh, if you go to verses 17 to 19, which is uh, the, the, the sum of the text that we're taking up now, it says, uh, for the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Uh, only that in every way, whether in pretense, pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that, I rejoice. And yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And if you go to chapter 2, verse 2, complete my joy uh, of being, uh, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And in chapter 4, uh, verse 1, uh, it says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for my joy and my crown. So Paul even considers his brothers and sisters in Philippi as his joy and his crown. So this is an ongoing theme uh, throughout this letter of Paul to the Philippians, uh, the theme of joy. Now, I know I can't see your faces um, usually when you have joy, it shows on your face, right? <laughs> and so hopefully uh, everybody here is enjoying, not just enjoying themselves, but have this joy in their hearts to just uh, be able to worship. Uh, even though we're, again, in separate places, uh, we're able to worship together as one body here at uh, GBC. So hopefully we have joy in that. Um, 
So let's go back to our text uh, in Philippians 1, 18 to 21. Uh, in the text, you're going to notice that Paul repeats that word, rejoice. Rejoice, both in verse 18. And again, if you, if you remember the context, why he's rejoicing, uh, you can remember that uh, uh, Paul being in prison, uh, first of all, he's rejoicing while he's in prison. Uh, and being in prison, he encouraged uh, brothers and sisters uh, to be able to uh, be more bold in, in sharing the gospel. Uh, but in their sharing, uh, some motives differed from others. Uh, some preached uh, out of uh, rivalry, uh, you know, out to outdo Paul, uh, and some preached out of love. But Paul says that, uh, you know what, no matter how the gospel is preached, as long as it is being preached, I can rejoice. That's why if you remember the sermon from uh, the last time I was here, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we said that in ministry is the same thing, uh, or churches are the same thing. As long as all churches are preaching the gospel, we can rejoice with them. We, we, we don't have to compete with each other. We're on the same team, and we can rejoice knowing that the gospel is being preached today, not just here, uh, but in every other evangelical gospel preaching church there is in the world. So hopefully we can rejoice in that uh, and not feel like as if we have to compete uh, with them. So uh, that's why Paul says, uh, you know what, I can rejoice even though, yeah, there are different motives in preaching the gospel, I can still rejoice because at the end, all I care about or all Paul cares about is for the gospel to be preached. So again, we can see that um, you know, Paul, despite being in prison, despite some people trying to outdo him can still re rejoice. So uh, the question for us this morning is how and where does Paul get this joy from? Uh, you know, based on what he's going through, how can he still have joy? And how can he still rejoice? Um, before answering that question, I think we should answer another question, uh, which will help us answer that first question. Okay? Uh, so our original question is, how can Paul continue to rejoice uh, despite his situation, uh, despite the circumstances, despite other people trying to undo him in preaching the gospel? Uh, where does he get his joy from? So for us to answer that, let's first answer this question, what is joy? Right? What is joy? Or better yet, what is Christian joy? What is biblical Christian joy? So for this, I'm going to refer to uh, three definitions that I looked up uh, in the internet. And hopefully from, that, from those three definitions, you'll be able to get a full picture of what joy is. Biblical Christian joy joy okay so the first first definition is coming from john piper he defines christian joy as and i quote it's a good feeling in the soul okay produced by the holy spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of christ in the word and in the world okay and that's how piper defines christian joy and he adds to it christian joy is not an idea it is not a conviction it is not a persuasion or a decision. It is a feeling or, and this is Piper's words, I use the words interchangeably here, it is an emotion. So joy, as far as Piper is concerned, is not something that you decide on. It's not something that you are persuaded to have, uh, but it is a feeling. It is an emotion. It's something that um, comes out of you. Um, it, it just comes out. Uh, it's an emotion, right? Um, and, and it's a feeling. So that's, that's, uh, that's how Piper uh, defines joy. Now let's look at other, another definition of joy in an article I found on the, on the internet. Uh, and it defines Christian joy in a, in a quite similar way. It says, the article says that joy, and again I quote, joy isn't like happiness. Uh, which is based upon happenings or whether things are going well or not. No, joy remains even amidst the suffering. Joy is not happiness. Joy is, is an emotion that's acquired 
by the anticipation or acquisition or even the expectation of something wonderful. So just like what Piper says, this, this joy is an emotion. And it's an emotion that boils up in us even if we haven't gotten the thing that we are you know, enjoying or we are wanting to enjoy. Because uh, it says that joy is an emotion that's acquired by the anticipation. Just anticipating uh, whatever it is that the thing is that brings you joy brings, uh, brings forth joy as an emotion. Um, and it, it remains in the midst of suffering. Uh, so it's not, so again, joy is not, oh, I broke my leg and you're still laughing. Like, ah, I broke my leg. Or, uh, you know, I lost my job, so I'm going to still laugh. And, you know, that's not joy. Um, joy is something else. It's deeper than, than that. And I think uh, this next definition uh, will give us, again, a, a, a fuller picture of what joy is. So this one is from C.S. Lewis. Uh, this was uh, taken from an unpublished letter. Uh, that he had that was stuck to one of his books. Um, and the, the, the quote goes like this, and again, I quote C.S. Lewis, that joy uh, must be sharply distinguished both from happiness and pleasure. Uh, joy, in my sense, or in the sense of C.S. Lewis, joy has indeed one characteristic and one only in common with them. And when he says them, he's talking about happiness and pleasure. Um, what is the common characteristic that joy has with happiness and pleasure? It is the fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. Uh, I doubt whether anyone who has tasted it or joy would ever, if both were in his power, exchange it for all the pleasures in the world. But then joy is never in our power, and pleasure often is. So for C.S. Lewis, joy is something different than happiness and pleasure. In fact, if you have tasted joy, that's what C.S. Lewis is saying, if you have tasted joy, you would be glad to exchange, this with, with, to exchange it for any and all pleasures in the world. So wow, what is joy in that sense, right? So when you think about those definitions, you think about Piper's definition, how joy is a, a good feeling in the soul, and the, uh, the second definition says that joy is, a, is an emotion and it remains uh, even amid suffering, or how C.S. Lewis puts how, how joy is different from happiness and pleasure. Based on those definitions, um, all of them agree that joy is not something you generate. It is not something we, we create. It is not something we, um, we are able to produce in ourselves. Um, so if, if, if that's what joy is, if, if, if joy is not something that you command, uh, and again, I like, I like Piper's illustration that joy is not like you telling your finger to go up and down. That's, that's not joy. Okay? You can't tell yourself if you're feeling really, really low and if you're feeling really, really anxious and depressed, you can't command yourself to become joyful or to have joy. That's not what joy is. And if that's not what joy is, then what is it? If, if it's not something that we produce, but we can still get it, where do we get it from? Uh, so uh, based, on, based on those definitions, again, the one that we took up, uh, we can say that joy is definitely a gift. So we can't produce it, but we still receive it then that means somebody must be giving it to us. Um, so we can say that joy is a gift. Again, it's not something that we produce on our own. And the Bible tells us where this joy comes from. The, the Bible says that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Right? The Bible is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is also a gift from God. Joy is a gift from God. Check out Romans 15, verse 13. Uh, let's go to that. Romans 15, verse 13. And the God of hope fill you with what? All joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So who fills us with joy? 
God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. And check out John 15, verse 11. Uh, John 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy be, may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Where did the joy come from? How did the joy get in us? Through the words that Jesus has spoken, as uh, it says there in John uh, 15, uh, verse 11. So joy is not something we produce uh, on our own. It is not something we create. It is not something we command. Joy is a gift and that gift, as we have seen in the Bible, is from God himself. Uh, joy is a gift from God. So uh, to have joy, again, is not the same as to have pleasure or to gain happiness. Why do I say that? Why does C.S. Lewis says that, says, say that? Uh, because both happiness and pleasure can be produced quickly. You want to be happy? Watch something funny. Uh, you want to have pleasure? Uh, what is it that gives you pleasure? Is it food? Is it uh, you know, going on vacation? Is it whatever it is? You can get that. Um, you can get, and sometimes you can get that right away. Um, but the problem with happiness and pleasure is uh, not that you, can't, you can get it right away. Actually, some people like it that way. That, you know, I'm happy right away. And I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, pleasure. Uh, I experience pleasure right away. But the problem with happiness and pleasure is that uh, even though you get it right away, it also goes away right away. <laughs> happiness and pleasure fade as quickly as how you got it. Um, and joy is not like that. Just like what we said in the definition uh, earlier. Joy is something that stays amidst even suffering. Uh, so unlike happiness and pleasure, joy is constant. Uh, and that's the thing with joy, since it's constant, it's either you have it or you don't. Right? It's either you have joy or you don't. Um, not, not to say that, you know, if you don't have joy, you're never going to get it. Uh, again, it, joy comes from God. It is a gift from God. Maybe we do have joy, but that joy needs to keep getting cultivated and cultivated and cultivated. As we get through the sermon, we'll see how we cultivate that joy that uh, we ought to have as believers. Uh, but right now, let me just say this, that joy, unlike happiness and pleasure, is constant. Either you have it or you don't. And the thing with joy is, again, it cannot be affected by external circumstances. That's why I said that this rainy day that we're having now is perfect to apply this sermon. Are we still having, or do we still have joy in the midst of the weather? Do we still have joy in the midst of this COVID pandemic? Do we still have joy in the midst of the job loss that we have experienced or the death and the uh, of a loved one that we have experienced? Do we still have joy in those uh, circumstances? Because joy is something that remains. It is something that is constant and not affected by any external circumstance. Uh, so having said that as well, we can uh, liken joy to being content. Because uh, that's what being content means, right? Uh, Paul uh, elaborates for us in Philippians 4.11. Uh, Philippians 4.11 says that, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Check out 12 as well. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In, an, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So for Paul, having joy is the same as being content. Right? It's the same as being content. That whatever situation, whether in abundance or in need in every circumstance Paul said that he learned the secret what is the secret to still being joyful in those circumstances is to be content uh, so in other words we can say that contentment is a continuous never-ending satisfaction okay, let me say that is a continuous never-ending 
satisfaction. And no, they are not the same thing. Satisfaction and contentment are different. And let me just quickly say the difference between these two. Being content means to be satisfied all the time. Okay? Satisfaction is something that happens when there is a hunger or desire in you that needs to be satisfied. It usually comes from the outside in. Uh, and it satisfies your whatever that desire is for a while. And then what happens is that satisfaction fades and you need to be satisfied again. So when we talk about satisfaction, you think about it like, like hunger. You know, Hunger uh, can be satisfied, right? Uh, just have a Snickers. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's not a plug for Snickers. Uh, <laughs> hunger, all right, for you to satisfy your hunger, you have to eat food, right? Once you eat food, your hunger is gone. It is satisfied. But a couple of hours later, or some of us, you know, a few minutes later, <laughs> hunger comes again. Uh, it's like an itch, same thing. When the itch needs to be scratched, you scratch it, especially mosquito bites. You scratch it, and then the itch goes away. After a while, the itch comes back, and you need to scratch it again for it to be satisfied, for that need to be satisfied again. Contentment is like, uh, you know, it's like an ongoing scratch. It's an ongoing feeding. It's an ongoing satisfying of our needs. And it never ends. And it never, it's never affected by, again, circumstances. never affected by anything external. Uh, that this, this, this never-ending satisfaction is, is, uh, uh, is within us. That's why uh, whatever it is that comes our way, we are still joyful. We are still, uh, you know, satisfied. And that's why I say that it's the same thing as joy because joy is that. Uh, it's the same thing, you know. Uh, based on the definition we took up earlier, that's what joy is. It's like contentment. It's always a, uh, this feeling of being satisfied no matter what's going on uh, around us. Um, so in a sense, joy is like being uh, content. Uh, we can also say that uh, joy uh, is, like, uh, is like faith in a sense. Joy is like faith in a sense. In what sense? Well, faith is a gift, right? Like joy is a gift. We cannot produce either joy or faith on our own. It has to be given to us. You can't force yourself to believe if you really don't believe. Right? It has to be given to you so that you will believe. And also, faith, like joy, is not rooted on a decision. Again, you can't decide to be joyful and you can't decide to have faith. It is not something that we can awaken or will to happen within ourselves. Uh, we just don't have it in us to be able to produce faith and to be able to produce joy. So in that sense, they are similar. And just like joy, just like what I said earlier, you either have faith or you don't. Same thing with joy. You either have joy or you don't. But here's the thing. If you have it, both joy and faith cannot be taken away as well. Once you have faith uh, and real saving biblical faith, uh, we're going to get into that again later on. Once you have that, it cannot be taken away. Both remain with us forever. So in that sense, both joy and faith are similar. So please don't get me wrong when I say joy, joy and faith is similar. Okay, You cannot be saved with joy. <laughs> Okay, you cannot be justified with joy. Only f faith can justify. Okay, for those of you who are already thinking that, uh, okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that joy justifies. I'm just saying it's similar in that it is a gift. It cannot be taken away, um, and it is not rooted on any decision. It's not something we produce. Um, but in terms of salvation, obviously, it's it's totally different. So um, now, when you think about it. Okay, true faith, okay, is always and or results in joy. True faith always or is accompanied by or results in joy because the essence of true faith contains joy. 
Okay? You, you guys get that? Uh, the reason why I'm trying to, 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 to do this is because faith and joy, they, they, they work together. Okay? Uh, and we have to be able to relate them to each other. And, and I'm saying that true faith will always result in joy. True saving faith will always result in joy. And that's because the essence of true faith, what makes up true faith, contains having joy. All right? Um, I know it's probably still going, you know, over our heads. But let me, let me explain. Let me unpack this some more. And this is what I hope to show you today. I hope to show you that uh, both joy and faith relate to each other. And how both joy and faith sustains a believer's contentment. Okay? Being happy, being satisfied in whatever situation they are in. Joy and faith help sustain that in a believer. Um, and I think that when we see this, when we understand this relationship between joy and faith, it will also help us understand how Paul, in our text this morning, is able to rejoice despite being in prison and despite what's going on even outside of prison. Uh, he is able to rejoice. How, how does he do that? Uh, hopefully we'll see it when we see the connection of the relationship between joy and, and faith. And for that, we're going to get out of the book of Philippians. We're going to go to John 6. John 6, verse 35. Oh, I'm already 28 minutes in. Right, we got to do this a little bit faster. Okay? But hopefully you can follow along. John 6, 35 says... Uh, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Okay? And Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, what I want you to notice first in this verse is the parallel that Jesus draws, uh, Jesus draws out for us. Okay? In the whoever statements, okay? If you look at your Bibles, there's two whoever statements there, okay? Jesus said, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. What parallels that is the other whoever statement, whoever believes in me shall never thirst, right? Now, in both whoever statements, Jesus draws this parallel of coming to him to believing in him. So when he says, whoever comes to me, in one statement, and then he says, whoever believes in me, in the other statement, he's paralleling a coming to him as a believing in him. So when Jesus says, come to you, when Jesus says whoever comes to me, it's the same as saying whoever believes in me. Okay? So a coming to Jesus is a believing in Jesus. That's the first parallel that he draws in the whoever statements. Right? A coming to Jesus is a believing in Jesus. Now, Look at the results of the, both the whoever statements. Again, look at John 6.35. A coming to Jesus will result in what? No more hunger. Right? A satisfaction of hunger. And a believing in Jesus will result in what? No more thirst. A satisfaction of thirst. So now both, and again, notice that both, uh, the end or the results of the whoever statements or the result of a coming or believing in Jesus is always satisfaction. So when, you, when Jesus says, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, whoever believes in me shall never thirst, he's saying that whoever has faith in him will be satisfied. Whoever has faith in Jesus will be satisfied. A coming and a believing in Jesus, satisfaction is reached. So when we rephrase that, okay, let's rephrase both of the whoever statements, okay, um, to make this, these parallels more clear and more evident, right? So the first whoever statement says that those who come to Jesus will have their hunger satisfied. And in the second whoever statement, it says that those who believe in Jesus will have their thirst satisfied. Are those two different things? I don't think so. I think they're parallel. I think they're saying the same thing. I think that what they're saying is that a coming or a believing or having faith in Christ will lead to a never-ending satisfaction. Which earlier, if you can remember, we said that this was the same as 
contentment. Right? Never ending satisfaction is the same as contentment. And never ending satisfaction, if it's the same as contentment, would be the same as joy. Right? So that's what that's the relationship between joy and faith. That's what true saving faith means. A true saving faith is a partaking of the bread of life that Jesus says he was in, in John 6, 35. And then a believing in Jesus as Messiah, as Savior, right? And then in our coming and believing in him, the result is always what? Never-ending satisfaction. Never-ending satisfaction with all that God is for us and will be for us in Jesus. Now, this means that for a believer, the gift of faith will always come with the gift of joy. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, because uh, a grumpy Christian is an oxymoron. Right? There's no such thing as a grumpy Christian. If the gift of faith will always come with the gift of joy because the faith that is given to us is a faith to come and believe in who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it always leads to what? Never-ending satisfaction. You will never again hunger. You will never again thirst. You will never again want for anything else. Then that means it comes with contentment. And contentment means joy. Same thing as joy. Uh, so hopefully we all get that. So again, there, there, there should be no believer that is grumpy or always sad or always like, you know, a believer is always content because he has hope that because of his faith in Christ, he has everything that he needs. Uh, or he or she has everything that they need. That's why there's no such thing as a grumpy believer. And that's why... Um, also, to answer our question, gift of faith, okay, always comes with, at, at its essence, will always come with the gift of joy. And the joy that it comes with faith in Christ is a joy that is unbreakable. Or like I like to say, it is bulletproof joy. Uh, it is a joy that is a good feeling in the soul. Remember our definition? It is a joy that is a good feeling in the soul. It is a joy that is an emotion that bursts out of a believer's heart at the expectation or anticipation of something great or wonderful. That's the joy that we were trying to define earlier. And that joy ro is rooted in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as C.S. Lewis puts it, it is something that once you have tasted of it, you will exchange it for all the pleasures this world has to offer for it. Right? If you have that kind of joy, if you experience that kind of joy in Christ, you will exchange it for anything that this world has to offer as far as pleasures are concerned. Again, because those pleasures, they are temporary. They come and go. But this joy, this contentment, in Jesus, knowing that through Christ we have everything, that our hunger and our thirst will be satisfied, knowing that, you know, we are always joyful, we are always content, no matter what happens here, no matter what happens in this world. So again, what makes Christian joy unbreakable, what makes it bulletproof, is because this joy is based on, it is rooted in someone who never stops satisfying someone who has no limit when it comes to the satisfaction that he brings and gives to those who has faith in him right that's why christian joy is bulletproof it is unbreakable because it is based on someone who never stops giving never stops satisfying in fact he is called the bread of life, the, the, the bread of life in John 6.35. That when you eat this bread, you will never go hungry again. Right? And he's also called the living water in John 4, 10 to 14. Remember? Uh, the living water in John 4, 10 to 14, when he was talking to the, the woman at the well, he says that you don't have to, you know, once, once I give you this water to drink, you will never be thirsty again. In fact, living water can will spring up in you. So that you will never be thirsty again. 
Um, that is what faith in Christ brings to those who believe. Eternal, never-ending satisfaction. Or, we can call it J-O-Y. Right? And this is why Christian joy is, again, unbreakable. Because the one who gives it will never run out and is always faithful to give. All right? That answers our first question. What is the relationship between faith and joy? The relationship is, and it's in the middle of it, what puts them together is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? No, he calls us to come to him, to believe in him. And when we do, he brings forth endless satisfaction, endless contentment, endless joy. Right? That's why when you look at Paul's statement in our text, that's why he can rejoice, right? No matter what kind of situation he's in, as long as he has Christ by faith, he can rejoice. Again, Philippians 1, 18. First part of verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed in that I rejoiced. So Paul rejoiced even, there, even though there were brothers and sisters who were preaching the gospel with the wrong motives. He is able to rejoice because his focus, the focus of his joy, or the root of his joy is not on the preaching, it's on Christ being preached. As long as Christ is preached, Paul can rejoice. doesn't matter if they're trying to compete with him. It doesn't matter if they're you know, trying to outdo him. It doesn't matter. Uh, as long as Christ is preached, he can rejoice. Even if he's in prison, he can rejoice because in, re in prison, more people became more bold to preach, right? If you remember the first part of our, our study in, in, in uh, the, this chapter of Philippians, right? That's why he's able to rejoice. And then look at the next part, 18 to, uh, the, the last part of 18 to 20. It says, yes, and I will rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul is able to rejoice because of the hope that he has of being freed. And look at the context, not just freed from prison, but even if he's freed from life, if he is taken to death, if he's taken out of this world, freed from this world through death, he can still rejoice. And he, 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 did, he, he offers it, to, or the reason that he gives for that is because he knows that the prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus, or through the prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus, so the prayers of his brothers and sisters in Philippi and the help of the Holy Spirit of Christ, uh, it will all lead to his deliverance. Whether it be from prison or from deliverance from this world, he will be delivered. He will be free. And he's happy in that because he has hope that no matter what happens to him, if, it, uh, you know, if he dies or if he remains in prison or if he's freed from prison, it will always result in the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Again, because for Paul, Christ is the only thing that matters, whether in life or, by, or in death. Uh, 21, right? Everybody should memorize this verse. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if Paul lives, he will live to and for Christ. If Paul lives... If Paul lives and stays in prison, he will continue to preach the gospel in prison. If Paul gets freed from prison, he will continue to preach the gospel. If he dies, what? He gains Christ. So if he dies, he gets to have whatever it is that he was preaching about. <laughs> whatever it is that he believes in, he will finally receive. Right? So for him, both, both cases doesn't really matter. Right? If I live, I live for Christ. If I die, I get Christ. It doesn't matter. And in that, Paul says, what? I rejoice. 
he rejoices. Being convinced of that truth, Paul rejoices. And he's encouraging us to rejoice with him. Those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not saying that we, should, we shouldn't take care of our bodies. I'm not saying that we should, you know, expose ourselves to COVID because we don't care about dying. I'm not saying that you should cross the 401 with a blindfold on. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm just saying that it doesn't matter what happens. As long as you go about your way in the path that God has laid out for you in obedience, if you die along the way, it's okay. <laughs> it's all good, right? But if you continue to live along the way, don't be discouraged by these bad things that are happening. Don't be discouraged by problems and anxieties and tribulations and trials. Don't be discouraged by any of those things because why? We have hope. Now one day, Christ will make this all work. Right? All we have to do is continue to believe, continue to abide in Him and His Word. Now when you live like that, live like Paul does, we are able to what? Rejoice in any circumstance because we have that hope that because we have faith in Christ all our needs all our desires all our cravings and our and our you know our hunger and our needs are going to be satisfied completely uh, whether here on earth or in the next uh, life in eternity um, so that's why we can all rejoice and I think when we look at this in application uh, again, Christian joy is something that all believers in Christ should have. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, the extent of the joy you have should be the same. Uh, some of us can uh, have, have uh, you know, a stronger faith than others. We're more mature when it comes to our faith than others. So we're able to absorb more, you know, trials and tribulations and still have joy and still be content. So I'm not saying that, you know, we all have the same, but what, when you trust in God, you trust in Him, you trust in Him through Christ because you see Christ as that all-satisfying source of contentment. That whatever it is that you need, hunger, thirst, He can satisfy that He is enough. No matter what happens in this world, if you have Christ, He is enough. Uh, and that's the joy that comes with faith. And all Christians, if you say you have faith, if you profess faith, you should have that joy. Something like that joy may not be as strong as others, but it's, you have to have something that will help you be content in whatever situation you're in. And again, this joy is not the same as happiness. It is not the same as pleasure. This joy is built in the hearts of those who believe in Jesus because this joy is not dependent on any circumstances or situation. It is dependent on Christ himself. That's why our title is, I've got joy down in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. Because that's where Christ's joy, faith in Christ, the joy that that brings is, is located deep, deep down in our hearts so that there's no circumstance, there's no situation that could ever affect it. This joy is, uh, just like what Piper says, this joy or this good feeling for the soul or this emotion that bursts from our hearts cannot be taken from us by this world. It is the fuel for our faith when times get rough. Okay, Joy is fuel for faith. Like, see, see how they relate? Now, I said that faith brings about joy, and joy at the same time is fuel for faith. Fuel for faith when times get rough. What keeps you believing? Uh, uh, Hebrews 12, 1 to, uh, 1 to 2 says what? For the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross, despising its shame. Uh, so same with us. You know, what's going to keep us going if there are, you know, if we bear our cross every day? And we have crosses to bear every day. Trials, tribulations, you know, problems that you have. Uh, you have those to bear every day. What keeps your faith grounded? It's your joy that is set ahead of you. It's that joy and hope that one day I will get Christ. One day Christ will be mine, like, like for real. And hoping in that, that, you know, that one day that will happen, but at the same time, um, in this world, Christ is able to satisfy whatever it is that you are, um, that you need, whatever it is that you, that you, uh, you know, think that you're, you're, that you're anxious about. Um, just trust in God. Give it up to God. He is able 
to give whatever it is that you need and whatever. Oh, well, first of all, whatever is best for you. Um, so I know, I know, we, we, me and my wife were discussing the lottery, and you know, is it good to, you know, it's okay for a Christian to buy a lotto and blah 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 blah, because God can, God can, uh, you know, answer your prayers no matter what anyway, right? So if you need money, maybe the answer is in lotto, <laughs> right? So is that? Is that a you know oh, is, is that something that we can rely on that we should kind of uh, pursue in terms of um, you know God providing for our needs? You know what? Maybe God will give you lotto, will let you win the lotto, or allow you to win the lotto. But again, God gives you what is best for you, and best for you is to be with Him. And a lot of times, money will kind of draw you away from that. So the more money you have. The more, you know, the more you have to get away from God. And that's what money does. That's why it's considered an idol in the scriptures, right? Money is the, the love of money is the root of evil. Now, if you just trust in God's daily provisions for your needs, you don't have excessive amounts of money, then your faith will continue to remain in Him. Um, but for us to think that, oh, God, just give me all the money so I can pay for all my debt. So just give me all of this so that I don't, I don't have to worry. Um, God's like, no, 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 that's, that, that's not good for you. Um, this is what's best for you is for you to trust in me every step, step of the way. Every day for your needs, trust me and I will always be faithful. I will always come through. Uh, again, living like that and thinking that way uh, will help us to rejoice in whatever circumstances they're in. Uh, some of us might be short in finances right now. But if we trust God, we know that God will come through when we absolutely need the money or whatever it is that we need. He will be there to provide it for us. Uh, it doesn't have to be the lottery. Um, but anyway, that's how you, you get joy. That's how joy is a fuel for faith when times get rough it is joy is the strength for our souls when the world seems to be or when our world seems to be breaking down joy is the light in the darkness when we are depressed when we are feeling anxious when we have all kinds of problems uh, when we have all kinds of sorrows that are in our way or that are that we're experiencing right now joy is the light in the darkness of those sorrows um, and again um, that joy is rooted in faith that the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate satisfaction for all our needs no matter what they are and lastly joy is our weapon against trials and temptations how does Paul rejoice being in prison because of faith and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ right because he has that hope how do we fight temptations when temptations is is you know tempting us with temporary pleasure we fight it with a greater pleasure with a greater satisfaction that can be found in the Lord Jesus Christ it's our weapon against trials and temptation and again joy um, is this gift it's a gift from God for those who believe a gift to see Christ as the greatest source of never-ending satisfaction that no matter how the uncertainties and trials and problems of this world continuously try to rob us of satisfaction and happiness having Christ in our lives by faith will always be enough right Solomon said that in Ecclesiastes right Solomon says that you know this world there's pleasure that can be found in it but there's a limit always uh, and really you can't you can depend on those pleasures uh, and then Paul is telling us no 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 there is a higher form of pleasure and it's in, and it's in joy and it's in joy in Christ by faith so uh, when we think about that and we think about joy hopefully that will um, you know help us propel ourselves forward especially those of us who are struggling spiritually and even emotionally and, or, or whatever financially um, whatever situation you're in right now if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ there should be joy still there should be contentment where we're at no matter how you know how sad or how bad our circumstances there should always be joy because our hope is not in this world our joy and our happiness not rooted in this world it is rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So, hopefully you'll be able to sing. I've got joy down in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. All right? Um, hopefully, uh, I will see you again next week as we continue to journey to Paul's letters to the Philippians. I, I like next week's topic because I, I speak about it a lot. I speak about death and, you know, God, take me out of this world. It's better to be with you. Uh, but Paul gives us his view on that uh, because sometimes, you know what, as Christians, sometimes it's, it's better to just... Just, you know, just take me out of this so that I don't have any more problems. Just get me out of this. You know, I'm, I'm so jealous of, uh, I remember Nani Jerry? Uh, Nani Jerry passed uh, a few weeks ago or months ago. Um, but it, it was during the COVID lockdown. And I'm like, oh, man, Nani Jerry got away from this lockdown. <laughs> She's so blessed. She's not, she doesn't have to be locked down anymore. She's up there in, in eternity. And sometimes you ask God, like, Man, why am I still here if I'm just, my life is just filled with problems. Why am I still here? What's my purpose? Paul tells us in the next part of the Philippians, uh, chapter one of the Philippians. So hopefully you can come back again next week for that. So uh, let's, go, let's close with a word of prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. Gracious, gracious, gracious.